Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for an anthology reading celebrating the release of We Are the Babysitters Club, essays and artwork from grown-up readers, led tonight by editors Megan Milks and Marissa Crawford. Um, we'd like to begin tonight by acknowledging that the land on which the bookstore is located is the occupied, unceded, seized territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, and Miami people. There are over 75,000 indigenous people of many nations living in Illinois, and we strive to recognize and honor native histories, literature, and communities. We encourage all viewing to learn more about the land on which they are currently viewing this program from, and one place to start is by visiting native-land.ca. Uh, my name is Carly Nussbaum, and I work as the Outreach and Sales Liaison for Women and Children First. We are one of the last remaining feminist bookstores in the United States, so thank you for your ongoing support. Our physical bookstore is open, but you can still order a copy of We Are the Babysitters Club and more from our website at womenandchildrenfirst.com. There's also the convenient buy the book box right at the bottom of your screen. Events are a vital part of our store's mission, and if you're interested in learning more about our events each month, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter or check our website. For example, coming up on September 1st, we're hosting a virtual reading for How to Raise a Feminist Son um, by Sonora Ja. Now I have the privilege to introduce the editors who will be leading this anthology reading tonight. Marissa Crawford's writing on pop culture, art, and feminism has appeared in Harper's Bazaar, The Nation, Hyperallergic, Vice, and elsewhere. She is the author of two collections of poetry, Reversible and The Haunted House, both from Switchback Books, and is the founder of the feminist literary website, Weird Sister. Megan Milks is the author of Margaret and the Mystery of the Missing Body and Slug and Other Stories, forthcoming from Feminist Press, as well as Tori Amos' bootleg web ring, forthcoming from Instar Books, and also a return guest to Women and Children First. We Are the Babysitter's Club brings both comfort and critique as the authors reflect on a series that was formative for so many of us. Um, I personally can't wait to hear from all of the contributors tonight. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Marissa Crawford and Megan Mills. Thank you so much, Carly. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, we're so thrilled to be partnering um, with Women and Children First. Thank you so much for hosting us um, and please support this amazing um, feminist independent bookstore and feminist institution. Um, we love the space so much. Um, and thank you also to Chicago Review Press and to our agent, um, Rach Crawford, for their support on our book. And thank you all again for being here. Yes, uh, ditto for me. Thank you all for being here. Um, we're very pleased to be here celebrating the release of We Are the Babysitters Club, which um, collects essays and artwork from 24 writers and artists, um, reflecting on the legacy of Anna Martin's iconic book series. Um, we're happy to have five contributors here with us tonight to share excerpts from their essays from the book. Um, but we're going to start things off with a BSC trivia quiz. Um, so the stakes are high. The winner of this BSC trivia quiz um, is will get a free book. Um, oh wait, what am I doing? That is the wrong window, sorry. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, so uh, the way that we're gonna do this is if you'd like to participate, um, please uh, post your responses question by question um, in the chat and we'll uh, go over it afterwards and, and see who got the most questions right. Probably there might be multiple winners. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Uh, okay. And if you would like to be in the running for the prize and or receive updates about the book, please email Women and Children First at the address that Carly just dropped in the chat. Thanks, Carly. Um, okay. Question one of nine. Thanks, Marissa. Um, guess the babysitter's handwriting. Uh, this is a little bit of a preview of um, Kelly's uh, essay, which you're about to hear an excerpt from. 
Is it A, Christy, B, Claudia, C, Stacy, or D, Marianne? Okay, everyone's very good. Um, the answer is C, Stacy. Okay, question two. Very good, everyone. Uh, what was the title of the last, this is kind of a stumper. Well, it might be for some of you. What is the title of the last book in the original series? Was it A, Christy at Bat, B, Stacy versus the VSC, C, St Jesse's Big Break, or D, The Fire at Marianne's House? <laughs> okay, anyone else? <laughs> they are all intense, yes. The answer is D, the fire at Marianne's house. Very good. Uh, our superstar contributors are getting them all right. Um, no, everyone survived the fire at Marianne's house. Um, okay. Number three, guess the babysitter's hair. And this is um, art from Buzz's piece from the anthology. Is this A, Christy, B, Claudia, C, Stacy, or D, Marianne? Okay, very good. Uh, the answer is D, Mary Ann. And yeah, this is her makeover haircut that the other babysitters did not like. Um, okay, question four. Which babysitting charge was known as the walking disaster? Was it A, Bart Taylor? B, Jackie Radowski? C, David Michael Thomas? Or D, Nikki Pike? Okay, is that everyone? Um, that is correct. <laughs> yes, great way to re refer to it. A child, he's in the center here. Uh, the answer is B, Jackie Radowski. Um, and five, guess the babysitter's fashion. I'll just read the first sentence. You all will all get this. <laughs> I decided that my theme for the day would be the C. Who is this? <laughs> <laughs> wow, very good, Logan. <laughs> uh, okay, that is correct, Claudia. All right, six. What was the surprising Christy and the Mother's Day surprise? Was it A, Emily Michelle joining the family? B, Bart inviting Christy to the dance? C, Christy's dad showing up? Or D, Christy's mom getting engaged? All right, is that all we got? Okay, uh, yeah, that is correct. A, Emily Michelle joining the family. <laughs> um, okay, seven, guess the baby's sitter's lunch. Who is this who likes brown rice, tofu, and seaweed salad? <laughs> okay. Okay, <laughs> great work, everyone be Don. Two more. Eight. In which of the following productions did Jesse perform? A, Swan Lake, B, The Nutcracker Suite, D, Capellia, or D, all of the above? The answer is... D, all of the above. And our last one, which is pretty easy. Um, in BSC number one, where does the idea for the BSC come from? 
Is it A, Mrs. Thomas having a hard time finding a sitter for David Michael? B, Marianne not allowing, isn't allowed to babysit unless she's part of a professional organization? C, Claudia needing money for art supplies? Or D, none of the above? <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, the answer is A, Mrs. Thomas having a hard time. But you're right, Logan, all of them are true. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing one sec. Okay, here we go. Okay, we should have made that harder. <laughs> Uh, we have really um, mighty competitors this evening. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all for participating in trivia. Thank you for putting that together, Megan. It's incredible. I'm really excited to introduce our first reader, who is Logan Hughes. Logan is a software developer, bird watcher, and fanfic enthusiast. He is the author of Sixth Grade Detective, a middle grade's interactive novel from Choice of Games. He lives in Boston with his partner and a growing collection of succulents. Welcome, Logan. Hello. I forgot what I wrote as my bio. I should have included some of the succulents. Um, so I am going to be reading from my piece. I'm going to be reading out of the actual book. Um, it's called No Ship Too Small, a deep dive into Babysitter's Club fan fiction. The difference between being a fan and fandom is other people. You can be a fan by yourself, but fandom requires community. I've been a fan since my childhood days of consuming Babysitter's Club books by the fistful, but I didn't enter fandom until my mid twenties. I'd moved far away from my college friends to strike out on a new life in a new country, and I was lonely. Fan fiction was a reliable source of online friendship and supportive writing buddies. My favorite subgenre was gay romance, known as slash fiction, because of the relationship-based tagging convention, Kirk slash Spock. It was a subculture that celebrated the strangest parts of me, my nerdiness, my queerness, my baby trans interest in seeing the, wor the world from a male point of view, what Danny M. Lavery calls the slash fic to gay trans pipeline. It didn't occur to me to combine my love of slash fic with my love of the Babysitter's Club, although I was the kind of adult fan who owned stacks of the books and reread them at the most stressful times of my life. I don't know why that's in past tense. It should be present. Um, to me, slash was something you did to reclaim toxically masculine sci-fi and procedural shows and transmute them into kinder, gentler, queer romance stories. The beautiful, violent man on TV becomes the beautiful, vulnerable man who questions his feelings and expresses his love for another beautiful man, perhaps this one a scientist. The Babysitter's Club didn't seem to call out for that kind of treatment. And then I signed up for Yuletide. Yuletide is a massive, rare fandom fanfic exchange that takes place every year around Christmas time. Fanfic writers describe the story that they wish existed and the fandoms they're willing to write, and the story requests are matched to the offers via an increasingly high-tech web form. I began participating in 2009, the same year the festival moved from the blogging platform LiveJournal to the fan-run website Archive of Our Own, AO3. I'd never read any other Babysitter's Club fan fiction, and I had no idea what would be requested. Were Babysitter's Club readers kids and teens, or adults who'd read the books when they came out, like me? Would my recipient want a kid-friendly babysitting storyline, a gossipy teen story about who likes who, maybe femslash or lesbian romance where two of the sitters got together? My 2010 recipient was an AO3 user known as Ms. Marvel, who typically wrote male male slash about comic books. I never in a million years would have predicted her request. Male male slash about a future relationship between teenage Byron Pike and teenage Jeff Schaefer uh, I don't think I have to explain to the Babysitter's Club experts here that that is one of Mallory's younger brothers and uh, Dawn's younger brother, who have very little screen time uh, in the original series. It's hard to overstate how delighted this request made me. It had not occurred to me that I could write my favorite genre for the Babysitter's Club, a series with almost no men. I never would have come up with the idea, but when I began to imagine their futures, I could see the possibilities. Byron is sensitive and misunderstood. 
Jeff is a cool surfer dude with emotional problems. Ideas were already forming in my mind. As soon as I sat down to write, my story poured onto the page effortlessly. The Pike triplets are now 15 and run the BSC. Byron and Jeff's slow burn summer romance unfolds against a backdrop of BSC business drama. By the end of the month, I'd finished an epic 15 chapter BSC book length story that remains one of the fan works that I'm most proud of. 10 years later, my recipient, Ms. Marvel, and I are still friends. Unlike me, she was an active uh, participant in the Babysitter's Club live journal communities in their heyday in the early 2000s. When I recently asked her what it was like, she waxed nostalgic. Suddenly there were communities for niche BSC interests. One for all fem slash, ones where you could just follow somebody's BSC sim storyline, interactive RPGs, she wrote to me over email. We could bond over what seemed like universal fan experiences, like wondering how you pronounce Mariah or misreading Byron as Brian, and having a dream where you stumble on a new BSC book you've never heard of before. Fans fled LiveJournal in the late 2000s when its new parent company began purging accounts it deemed unacceptable, including erotica and even non-sexual LGBT content. Creators responded by banding together and building archive of our own as a safe haven for fan fiction, especially Slash. Many BSC stories and writers have since found their way there. Um, and I took a glimpse into the vibrant world of Babysitter's Club fan fiction on Archive of Our Own in the rest of the essay, but that is where I will leave it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Logan. I love that essay. Um, next up is Jamie Saylor. Jamie Saylor. Hi, Jamie. Uh, Jamie Saylor is a librarian living and working in the Arizona desert. They have been making zines, small circulation, self-published magazines for almost as long as, as they've been diabetic. Jamie's favorite beverage is lemonade, which yes, sometimes make their, makes their blood sugar high. Uh, thanks for being here, Jamie. Yeah, of course. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so I wrote about um, reading the Stacy books as through the eyes of someone who was also a preteen diabetic. On, on the surface, the truth about Stacy is she is diabetic. But from the very first book, the members of the Babysitter's Club and readers know about Stacy's diabetes. This does not stop them, Stacy's best friend, Claudia in particular, from constantly consuming high sugar snacks in front of her. Diabetes is an invisible illness and not a, di a diagnosis that is usually known unless it is revealed. There are diabetics who do not tell others, including their close friends and coworkers. My parents did not see secrecy as an option. During my first stay in the hospital, my parents contacted the administration of my school about my diabetes. Though one of the least popular kids in my grade, I still received an outpouring of get well cards by my, made for my classmates. I don't know what they were told exactly, but they all seem to take my diagnosis in stride. One bully did a creative new version of the diarrhea song from the movie Parenthood and saying, when you're sliding into first and you feel your pancreas burst, diabetes, diabetes. This was a welcome break from the usual harassment about my flaming red hair or the ease with which I could begin to cry and how quickly I could go from crying to violence. The effort of taking care of my diabetes without trying to hide it is difficult enough. Discussions about whether it is appropriate to test one's blood sugar and inject insulin in front of other people are common for di the diabetic community. At heart, these are discussions about disclosure. Being public about one's diabetic care exemplifies self-care and creates visibility for what can sometimes be an isolating and invisible disease. While some would advise against being too open about medical information, being open about my diabetes has helped keep me safe. It might not be the first thing you find out about me when we meet, but if we spend any time together, you're going to know that I'm diabetic. Once Stacy stands up to her parents regarding her diabetic care, she also lands on the side of disclosure, as does Anna M. Martin. Every time Stacy is introduced over and over in the second chapter of every Babysitter's Club book, her diabetes is disclosed. 
This disclosure helps destigmatize diabetes care. Much like seeing someone wearing a continuous glucose monitor, which you can see on my arm over here, <laughs> um, testing their blood sugar or taking their an insulin at a restaurant. Uh, this is the CC's access, ugh, CC success and struggles with her diabetic care throughout the babysitters. Club series create visibility and open up conversations for young adults surrounding not just diabetes, but other chronic illnesses. When contemplating the truth the title is referring to, Stacy's loneliness stands out to me. Having a chronic illness can be lonely. Throughout the truth about Stacy, Stacy worries about the Babysitters Club breaking up because of a rival baby babysitting club. She doesn't want to experience the loneliness she felt when Lane, her former best friend, stopped being her, stopped talking to her. While the other Babysitter's Club members know about her diabetes, their support is only so surface level. They do not change their behavior or food choices. They do not check in on Stacy about her health or her stress, other than when she's actually already in the hospital. Stacy's parents are the only ones who talk to her about her diabetic maintenance and control, but it's usually just to make decisions without consulting her. Food intake, insulin, stress, and exercise. Stacy is constantly monitoring herself. We see that sometimes she needs support from those around her. The two covers I've seen of the popular 2006 graphic novel adaption of The Truth About Stacy point to the truth that falls into the subtext of Stacy's stories. In both, the other Babysitter's Club members are together and smiling. On one cover, they are sharing candy. On the other, they appear to just be talking. Stacy is set apart from them, frowning. Diabetes sets Stacy apart from the other Babysitter's Club members, not merely because of what she isn't supposed to eat, but all the other things that Stacy is supposed to do. Stacy has to advocate for her own treatment. She has to be aware of how her body feels. She has to face the consequences when she ignores the stress and blood sugar levels. She has to manage her diabetes alone, with no other diabetics or chronically ill teens with whom to commiserate. While the Babysitter's Club's book do a great job overall in, of conveying what it's like to live as a preteen with diabetes, what strikes me at the, as the most painful realistic point is Stacy's loneliness. As a kid, I went to summer camp with a summer camp for diabetic children and teenagers. This was one of my first times away from my parents. All the other campers and most of the counselors were diabetic like me. I got to hear about the other camper struggles with maintaining their blood sugar. At camp, we talked about the ways our parents supported us or didn't support us. We got to talk about our diabetic regiments. We shared tips about our care, gossip about the doctors we liked and didn't like, and talked about what life was like being the only diabetic in our friend circles. For teenage me, diabetes camp was everything. Diabetes camp was my babysitter's club. And since we were all diabetic, no one had to be the diabetic one. I learned how to make and keep friends, which was a lesson worthy of the babysitter's club. Thanks. It's just me. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you so much, Jamie. I love that piece so much. It's so powerful. Um, so great to hear you read it out loud. Um, so our next reader is Kelly Blewett. Um, Kelly is an assistant professor of English at Indiana University East, where she directs the undergraduate writing program and teaches writing and pedagogy courses. Her scholarship explores writing pedagogy, reading, editorial practices, and feedback. Kelly is still an avid reader who journals about what she's reading. Welcome, Kelly. Hi, Hi. so good to have you. Um, I am just going to um, share some visual components that are part of your reading. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Yay, I'm so excited to be here tonight with you guys. Sorry, I'm just gonna make sure. Um, can you all see my screen? Are you still seeing me? Okay, let me try that again. 
Um, Carly, it's saying too many video sources. A stream is limited to six simultaneous video sources. So it says we need to remove a source to try again. I'm not sure if that's anything we can. Okay, let me try again. Thank you so much. Okay, can you all see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. By the way, I love your contribution in this book about the Stacy and Claudia essay. That's just a little aside. Um, okay, I wrote two diary entries on April 17th 1993, and the two do not look the same. While the left side entry features tighter, smaller print that is slightly leaning to the left, the right side entry displays larger, rounder letters that are standing straight up. Evidently, experimentation with penmanship characterized my private writing practices as a girl. But where did my models for experimentation come from? Part of the answer might be found in a sketch that I made of a book I happened to be reading at the time, The Babysitters at Shadow Lake. I wonder whether my 10-year-old self would have readily acknowledged how much her own writing was copied from that of the characters in the books she was reading. The lettering styles of Christy, Marianne, Stacy, like those of all the series characters, were developed by one graphic designer in the art department of Scholastic, Holly Tomasino. A look back on the history of handwriting in America shows that the handwriting of Christy and Marianne each had an identifiable historical precedent, and how fundamental differences between Christy and Marianne are reinforced through their handwriting. Stacy's script, on the other hand, is not so traditional. Tomasino invented Stacy's penmanship after remembering how the cool kids wrote in Queens, New York when she was growing up in the 70s. And maybe that's one reason that so many readers, like my friend Amanda, remember imitating Stacy's handwriting. I was definitely influenced by Stacy's writing, Amanda told me. I used to try to make my handwriting more fun and bubbly, and I even did the hearts to dot my lowercase i. I used to wish I was more girly and thought I could be if I worked on my penmanship. Handwriting is socially learned and culturally transmitted. And we readers of the BSC were the ones who got the message. In imitating the scripts we admired, we were using them to make sense of our own burgeoning identities. Reading as a child wasn't just to pass the time or enjoy the plot. It was to figure out who we wanted to be. It was Ann M. Martin's idea to include samples of the character's handwriting in the book. I wanted the handwriting to be included in the books in order to bring the idea of the BSC notebook more fully to life and thus make the club seem more real, she explained to me in a 2015 message. Tomasino created scripts for each of the babysitters which were approved by the publishing team and then generated for each series by hand from 1986 through 1996. In a 2018 interview with the Los Angeles Review of Books, she remembered her process for developing each script. And I'm going to quote from her here. The editors gave us a description of each of the characters in the series. They told us about their personalities, their likes and their dislikes, and their strengths and their weaknesses. And once I had a picture in my mind of each babysitter, I created a handwriting style that I felt would reflect them. The process felt very intuitive and fun. It came pretty naturally, probably because I loved handwriting and had different styles of my own penmanship anyway. And yeah, she did do it by hand. She did it with rapidograph markers on a kind of drafting table. So the handwriting samples usually appeared in the club notebook, which kind of recalls a genre of the friendship notebook that were popular in the 70s and the 80s. In BSC number 10, Marianne describes the notebook as a diary in which we write up every job we go on. Entries from the club notebook rarely continued for more than a single page, as you can see from these samples here on the screen. The shift from handwriting to computer generated font was often flagged with some kind of transitional phrase like, it started from the moment she entered the door. 
Beyond just introducing the chapter, though, the handwriting served a much more important function, as Anna Martin intended. It was a visual performance of the identity of the babysitter who was writing. Like the babysitter's ages and food preferences and favorite colors, their handwriting styles remained frozen in time from 1986 through 2000 and new reissues have since modified the script slightly. The handwriting narrowed what one scholar calls the proximity between the protagonist and the reader, something that is crucial to developing narrative intimacy between them. In a typeset chapter book for middle grade readers, the handwriting jumps out as a visual feature that disrupts the neat and orderly lines of computer generated font and provides a second embodied source of information about the character that young readers crave. Perhaps more so than kids now, kids then in the past when I read the books were attuned to lettering styles and what those differences might mean. Tomasino certainly was, and she explains what it was like when she was little in this way. As a little girl, I was always writing letters and cards to friends, and I paid attention to the mail. My family got lots of letters, and I could tell just by the handwriting who it was from. I was very aware of the different personalities the writing styles expressed. I loved what you might call the art of handwriting. I would imitate my mother's handwriting, which was very swishy-swashy and graceful and my best friend's handwriting, which was more bubbly and bold. Some handwritings I admired and some I didn't, but they all reflected personality, confident, bold, quick, sad, or shy. And I'll stop reading there. And the rest of the essay goes into the differences between Christy and Marianne before taking a closer look at Stacy's handwriting. Thank you so much, Kelly. That's such a fascinating um, essay. We're so happy uh, to have it in the book. Okay, next up is Yumi. Hi, Yumi. Hi. Yumi so Sakugawa happy. is a second generation Japanese Okinawan American interdisciplinary artist and the author of several books, including I Think I Am in Friend Love With You, your Illustrated Guide to Becoming One with the Universe, and The Little Book of Life Hacks. She currently lives in Los Angeles. Thank you, Megan. Um, before I jump in, I just want to say I just thank you, um, Women and Children Birth, for hosting this event. And also, um, it was such a treat for me as a contributor to go through everybody else's contributions and I'm just so honored to be part of such a luminous group so thank you everybody and of course thank you to the editors. Um, I'll be reading my comic essay Claudia Kishi, my Asian American female role model of the 90s uh, which was a short comic zine and web comic that I made um, probably back in 2012 and I'm going to be reading an excerpt um, right this moment. Claudia Kishi, my Asian American female role model of the 90s. I want to also say that this um, children's block lettering <laughs> took a really long time. I'm glad I don't have to do that again. I think Felicity and Kirsten are my favorites. Do you have any American girl dolls? As a Japanese American girl who grew up in the 90s, I still remember that during that decade, it was a rare occurrence to see Asian American female faces in TV shows, movies, cartoons, books, and as toy figures. Between 1990 and 1999, here are the Asian American female faces in popular culture I remember off the top of my head. Margaret Cho, an all-American girl, 1994. The show canceled after one season, and I didn't watch enough episodes for it to make an impression on my nine-year-old brain. Trini Kwan, the Yellow Ranger, and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, 1993. 
I may have been too busy crushing on Tommy, slash the Green Ranger, slash the White Ranger, to pay attention to the Girl Rangers. Christy Yamaguchi, Olympic champion, 1992. I lost complete interest in ice skating after my failed four-month experiment in ice skating lessons. Thankfully, during my naive childhood, I had one Asian American girl to look up to who was talented in art, fashion forward, crazy unique, extremely confident, and just like me, a second generation Japanese American. I am speaking, of course, about Claudia Kishi of the Babysitter's Club. In case you aren't a girl who grew up in the 90s, um, I'm gonna skip through these since <laughs> I think most of us know the basics of the Babysitter's Club and what it is. Um, but here's a panel of me walking from the local library with a big stack of BSC books and my dad um, being concerned with my reading diet saying, just Babysitter's Club books again. A few important facts about Claudia Lynn Kishi, age 13. Um, so I compiled some of the facts about um, Claudia Kishi, which we all know and love. Um, one of the things that I completely forgot about was that she was once in a love triangle between an eighth grader and a seventh grader. I love art and junk food, and purple is my favorite color, and I'm Japanese. I'm just like Claudia. In my eyes, Claudia was the coolest Asian American book character a nerdy and shy Japanese American girl like me could wish for. Never mind the fact that the descriptions of her physical appearance, jet black hair, flawless perfect skin, totally exotic, almond shaped eyes, had weird orientalist overtones. Speaking of weird orientalist overtones, you can't forget Claudia's older sister character, Janine, AKA poster girl for <coughs> the Asian American model minority stereotype. Claudia, I'm going to the library to study. Don't you have a book report to finish by tomorrow? Uh, whatever, Janine. You can't talk about Claudia without talking about her amazing sense of fashion. Um, so part of my zine, I highlight some of my favorite and most memorable Claudia moments. And of course, I had to highlight uh, number 56, Keep Out Claudia. Claudia's babysitting skills are rejected by the Lowell family, a bunch of racists who only want babysitters who fit the Aryan ideal a female Caucasian beauty. Guys, that was just Lowell. She says she only wants the blonde haired, blue eyed babysitters to watch her kids. What? And of course, I have to include Jesse thinking in a thought bubble, racist, Sony Brookers. What a surprise. Okay, I think um, that's all I will be sharing. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope um, those of you who haven't read the book yet, um, buy the book, like right this second, because it is the best thing ever. Thank you so much, Yumi. Um, we are absolutely obsessed with your comic. It's so great. Um, so we have one more reader tonight um, who is Miriam Gerba. Miriam is a writer and artist. She is the author of the true crime memoir, Mean, a New York Times editor's choice. Her essays and criticism have appeared in the Paris Review, time.com, and four columns. She has shown art in galleries, museums, and community centers. She lives in Long Beach, California with herself. Hi, Miriam, welcome. Hi. I apologize for coming to the event so late. I'm time zone challenged. Um, so I, I'm going to go ahead and, and read a little bit from, um, from my essay, um, that I'm going to read from on screen cause I don't have the book with me and, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the essay first. So I, um, 
I wrote about the like my my um, adolescent obsession with Babysitters Club and how I wanted to um, start my own babysitting business after I'm um, becoming obsessed with the series, but my parents prohibited me from um, from doing so. And um, I was really angry at them when they when they prohibited me from from starting my own babysitters club. But there are certain events that happened um, later on in my life that illuminated for me why my parents were being really restrictive um, about my behavior as um, as a young Latina who could potentially become involved in like caretaking work. So uh, I'll go ahead and um, and read a little bit from that essay. Um, it's titled Christie's Invisible Hand and Das Babysitter's Club Capital. My first encounter with girls as ardent capitalists happened between the covers of Anne M. Martin's Babysitter's Club books. The original series totaled 131 installments and from the series first page, its entrepreneurial bent roared. Quote, the Babysitter's Club. I'm proud to say it was totally my idea, even though the four of us worked it out together. Us is Marianne Spire, Claudia Kishi, Stacy McGill, and me, Christy Thomas, end quote. The series chronicled the fictional adventures of a marginally diverse girl collective in Stony Brook, Connecticut, as they grow and maintain a successful business. Common tween issues animated the series capitalist story arcs. I don't remember how Christie's great idea landed in my lap, but once I devoured that debut, I needed more. Hooked, I hoarded my allowance and gophered into the couch seeking derelict change. I brought my sweaty coins to our mall's B. Dalton bookstore and exchanged pennies, quarters, and dimes for YA money-making thrills. As I acquired more books, I not only got to know the babysitters better, I felt I was making friends with them. Friends serve as mirrors, they show you who you are, and I saw aspects of myself keenly reflected by two particular Babysitter's Club characters. I saw myself in Christy. She generated ideas, stuck to her guns, and gave orders. Her stubborn tomboyishness was my stubborn tomboyishness. I also developed a special affection for Claudia, since she was the club's token girl of color until Jesse joined the group 13 books later as a junior member, I saw my Chicana self reflected in her and Claudia's presence was so important to me, so magnetic that I doubt I would have become as emotionally invested in the series as I became had all its characters been white. The babysitters inspired me and Christie's entrepreneurial vision seemed plain yet elegant, easy to follow too. While Ma watching her mother grapple with childcare issues, ingenuity strikes Christy. After finishing her homework, she sketches a business plan. She nominates her friends, Marianne and Claudia, as business partners. She decides that they'll advertise childcare services using flyers, the telephone, and the newspaper. The club will have set hours of operation during which clientele can call and book a sitter. To generate startup capital, each member will pay dues. I'm writing about the club using an economic lens because I earn my paycheck doing a fearsome thing. I teach high school economics. In class, I borrow from and build upon the economic models and lessons embedded in the Babysitter's Club books. During lectures, I refer to instances like Christie's entrepreneurial combination of land, labor, and capital, and one project that I assign is directly inspired by the series. I invite students to work alone or with friends to develop a business plan. Once the plan for their sole proprietorship, partnership, or other organization has been researched and developed, they present it to their classmates and me. We respond with evaluations. My students' business plan presentations bring me joy that I was deprived of as a girl. When I tried becoming an entrepreneur, I crashed into what economists call barriers to entry. The primary barrier was bearded. I called it dad. Dad was also part of the reason I unofficially resigned from the Girl Scouts. My best friend, a blonde tomboy, invited me to join her troop, and I attended only a few meetings before cookie selling season arrived. Like Christy, Babysitter's Club president, I'm high-key competitive. 
I enter contests to win and our troop leader incentivized us to sell, 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 teasing us with a talk scented trophy, a Cabbage Patch Kid doll. This prize would be awarded to the brownie who sold the most sugar and I had major ganas to be that girl, la ganadora. Crowds the world over were rioting for Cabbage Patch Kids, the toy trend had swept California too, and rumors featuring parents who mugged children and ran off with their dolls impressed me. Those are good parents, I thought to myself. They were adjusting to shortages with loving violence. I'll go ahead and stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Miriam. That piece yeah. is so great. So great to hear it. Um, thank you so much to all of our readers. You all are amazing. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thank you to everyone who attended. Yes, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you to Women and Children First and to Carly. <laughs> Hi, I also want to say my thank yous and a few quick reminders. So thank you so much to the editors, Megan and Marissa for leading this anthology reading tonight. Um, I feel like I learned a lot I didn't know already and that's amazing. Um, thank you also to all of the amazing contributors for your essays, your readings and your art. This was an absolute treat. Um, two quick reminders. First, if you participated in the trivia and you want to enter for a chance to win a free book, please email WCF, like Women, Children First, WCFbooks at gmail.com. Just with your email address, say, hey, I, let me try for a free book. Um, and maybe you'll win one. Also, you can find this book as well as many of the author's other books from tonight in store or on our website. Um, that's the best way to support um, all of the contributors and authors tonight, as well as your local feminist bookstore. Um, thank you all again for being here. Uh, this reading will be located here on Crowdcast once the event ends. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night.